Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. Today we're going to talk a little bit about hex crawling. So after my procedural versus narrative video went live, I had a bunch of people ask me for more information about hex crawl since they are, as I mentioned before, kind of the classic procedure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what a hex crawl is, go through kind of the most basic way to do one, and then I'll talk about how I like to do hex crawls. So hex crawls are basically just moving through the wilderness in a procedural manner. You use a hex map to do that. That goes all the way back to the very first Dungeons and Dragons edition, original edition, where in Men and Magic, they tell you to get this other game, Outdoor Survival, which uses a hex map. And using that map with the rules that are in original Dungeons and Dragons, you could travel across the wilderness with your party, encountering castles and dungeons and monsters on the run, all kinds of fun stuff. It's about exploration. Now, there's lots of ways to move around in the wilderness, and I've talked about this a little bit before. You could, if you're just traveling from point A to B in kind of a safe space or this kind of stuff, you might not want to hex crawl for that. I think the best use of a hex crawl is when you're exploring new areas. If you are simply running a mega dungeon and it's two hexes away, and every single time you sit down to play, you're going through 20 minutes of moving through the hex crawl, encountering random stuff. That might not be as fun for the group, but it really depends on who you're playing with, obviously. So, you know, I, I say the best time to use hex crawls is when the party wants to go out and find stuff. They're looking for new places. They're exploring based on treasure maps they found. They're trying to clear lands so they can build their tower or castle. Or maybe there's a rumor that there's some other, you know, kingdom to the north. It's always to the north where they're going to go. And this is why we hex crawl. We're moving out through the wilderness. So you can handle hex crawls a lot of different ways, but at their most basic, they're a procedural and they're basically kind of like a board game. And I find what makes them fun for my group these days is I actually use the original outdoor survival board, or I use something like hex kit and print my own uh, area, and then I still move the characters around on it. I think it's fun. The players can look. They know how many hexes they can move per day. They can kind of move their little piece around. It adds a little bit of different depth to the game, which I think is really fun. I am doing a solo actual play right now where I'm using the outdoor survival map. So if you're interested in that, I'll put a link. You can kind of see how I play it out. But let's get into what is a basic hex crawl. So if you're thinking about hex crawling, and you don't have any rules to go by. This is what the process is. Number one, the party starts their day. At that point, they're going to determine which direction they want to move. So let's say they're going to the north, right? So they want to go north. They're going to move to the north. So what you're going to do is you're going to roll to see if they can successfully go in the direction they want to go. More simply put, if they get lost or not. Now, you can take lost a lot of different ways. Lost could be that they go off track because maybe it's cloudy or uh, rainy and they can't see the stars the right way or they get sent a weird direction because there's some kind of natural hazard in the way. Or a loss could just mean, right, they get stopped because, again, maybe a natural hazard. So however you want to play it out in the fiction, they can't go the direction or they go the wrong direction. Now, if you look at like something like Bold Bay Basic, which is my go-to system for most things, here's one place I don't, one thing I don't love. They basically say to keep two maps, right? The map the players are making and then the map the GM makes. And if people are lost, then you just kind of, kind of secretly mark on your map where they are. I find that to be a little bit of kind of a pain, to be honest with you. What original Dungeons and Dragons recommends and what I do is if they roll this thing that they're lost, they move one hex in a random direction. And then at that point, they can move the rest of their movement, either the backtrack or go around or whatever. So basically, they just lose a hex of movement. In an OD&D, they're moving three hexes a day. So that could be a big deal. So again, they pick the direction they want to go in. You see if they're lost. Next thing you do is you roll to see if there's an encounter. Usually in OD&D, they say the encounter happens at the end of the day. You can obviously place it wherever you want. For some reason, I feel like most people put it at the end where everybody's around a campfire and the monsters attack. But, you know, roll to see if there's an encounter. And if there is, roll to see what kind of encounter it is and put it where it makes sense is what I would say there. Assuming the party is either able to evade the encounter or somehow successfully bypass, you know, fight or negotiate, whatever. The day ends. So then finally, you just check off to see any supply that was used. So kind of your, you know, inventory stage, right? Did we use any food? Did we use any water? Is there something that's long going? Let's say I had a, a multiple day long spell running. Does that end? Stuff like that. You use that up. Now we're good. Now we move into the next day. What happens the next day? They determine which direction they want to go. You see if they're lost. You see if there's an encounter. You check supply. And you just basically rinse and repeat as they move across this hex. Some days... 
maybe multiple days. You might go through a week in 10 minutes with nothing really happening, right? Just things passing. Or you might encounter a lot of monsters or get lost a bunch. It really depends. And there's this kind of random element. And the party can be making their own maps if you want to do it that way, if they're exploring new terrain. Or again, they could just be moving over a map. Okay, so obviously, even if you're going to do it that way, I think adding flavor is super important. So going back to what I was talking about before, I think if you are playing in person or even easier, if you're playing on a virtual tabletop, it's nice to create some kind of visual and allow the players to move their piece, if you will, on the board. It creates a little bit of kind of another step that makes it a little more fun, I think, than just saying, we go north. Oh, we're lost. They can kind of see on the map. They can see where they're going. I know it's a little meta. Maybe they wouldn't have that information, but that's okay. It's a game, right? But definitely make sure that you add flavor. If you're going to make it so that they're going to need to roll every single day because they're hex crawling, if you will, then make sure that when they roll and nothing happens, still something happens, right? You describe the new terrain they're in. You describe what kind of general animals are around you or whatever. Maybe they're getting closer to the to the evil area, right? So you can be like, you know, you haven't seen any birds in a couple of days, stuff like that. One or two sentences is all you need. So that 10 minutes of traveling, you know, two weeks isn't just boring. You want to make it a little bit kind of interesting. But that's Hex Crawling 101. So for me, Hex Crawling can be a great way to just run almost an entire campaign. I ran a, a kind of Dying Earth themed campaign for a little while where basically the whole thing was Hex Crawling. And what I loved about it was it was always something to keep me on my toes because the way I did it was, and I'm going to show you my screen now, we're looking at my Hex Crawl encounters thing. I'll, I'll put this up in some form on, in a PDF, probably uh, in the like, public section of my Patreon so that everybody can download it if you want. There's a few things that are in here that I copy and pasted from sources online, which I will remove before I put it up there because it's not my stuff, but I will put a link to those things. But let's just kind of go through this quickly how I do it. Okay, so the first two steps that you do in a hex crawl, I do the same. Pick a direction, see if they're lost. Like I said, I do the OD&D method where if you are lost, you roll randomly, you move that direction first, then you can just recover and move wherever you want from that point. Then what I do is I roll 3d8 on this chart here. And it says morning, new night, but what I basically do with this is I combine this into something that happened during the day. So the on a roll of one or two, there is a monster and there's a breakdown. It could be a lair, it could be wandering, it could just be tracks. Uh, on three, a trap or hazard. When I say trap, it could be, let's say, like a, a goblin a cave system that the party's going to go near and the goblins have traps out to catch animals or possibly people going by, maybe pits or something like that, right? Or it could just be a hazard, you know, some kind of a, a, a river or so something that's in their way that's going to be something they have to deal with. Uh, a special is if you're using a keyed map, that is what I was in that campaign, every hex had something in it. Uh, if you rolled a special, then they encounter that thing. Because you got to keep in mind, a hex is big, right? It's like five miles. So you could walk right through a hex and not see the tower that is in there or whatever, right? I also have a totally random at the bottom, uh, which is what I roll if they if I get that and there's nothing keyed on the hex. Five, signs of destruction, which I'll show you I also got from online. I'll put a link to that. Uh, six would be a weather event. Seven is locations. Eight is pilgrims. So now we're basically looking at, you're going to create a little bit of a story, right? So... Each of these has their own charts you roll on, and you might look at it and go, okay, well, they start traveling, and what they find, uh, you know, the weather gets really bad, because let's say you roll a weather event, which then pushes them in a different direction, or they have to seek cover in these in this cave system because massive hailstones are coming down, or, I mean, that's probably what they'll do, or they'll take damage. Well, that cave system is a cave system of the goblins we just talked about, and th it's actually set up where this is actually a part of the cave that... They know it's near the pathway that people will run into if they have freak weather events. And when they go in there, the goblins try to trap them, possibly, right? Or maybe, and, and maybe, you rolled pilgrims. So maybe there's pilgrims that have already been captured in there. So you create this into something that is not necessarily three encounters, or they could be spread out, but something that you're going to create into like something that happened that day. This type of system makes it so that when you're hex crawling, and again, we're crawling, <laughs> Something's happening every day. So this is not a, we're trying to travel 50 hexes to get to this place that we really want to get to. This is really the hex crawl is the adventure. So I'm going to go through some of these tables because I think they're fun and I'll kind of talk about how I've used them a little bit. And like I said, I'll put a link. Okay, so for weather, uh, you know, again, we're rolling 2d6 here. 
freak event that might uh, cause damage to the party, unusual event that might damage equipment, inconvenient, it just slows them down, atmospheric, could cause uh, damage, or extreme, like a tornado, right? Then we've got traps or hazards. Again, it could be a trap set by a monster. It could be that they go off course because of a river. That could be difficult terrain. It could be impassable where they have to go back, or maybe they're caught in some kind of massive natural disaster. Now, assuming that there's a location, you can roll here. Ancient empty ruins, ruins that aren't empty, obviously. Temples, special locations. You got different types of ruins. This here I got from, and I'll put links to this stuff. I formed these charts basically rolling on this uh, D30 Sandbox Companion. I rolled a bunch of times on the tables and picked some other things, and I was able to create my own little clusters of stuff. If you find that you did that and you use one up, then you can always just make new ones. It wasn't hard to do. So you might find a villa slightly collapsed, infested with uh, chimeras and harpies. <laughs> I think I put two in there so I could just kind of roll randomly for myself. So now you got a, vi a villa that's slightly collapsed, infested with harpies. That's a great encounter, right? You can kind of make that work. Or if you had rolled empty, then it's a villa slightly collapsed, you know, not infested with harpies. Whereas if you run into a temple, you're going to find it might be abandoned. It might be non-fighting priests or a cult, right? It could be a, a stone mound with D5 rooms or a pagoda, right? And I've got some cults here. Here's a league, the Eclipse. They follow a female human magic user doing mayhem. <laughs> Sleep on beds of nail. And again, I rolled most of this using this and just other charts. So I've got this little thing. Now, once I have them encounter a cult, that cult goes into play. Obviously, I'm marking it on the hex. And this is going to be a faction now they can deal with. And I'll actually show you down here when I was playing this, I actually got, they encountered this cult right here. The Rune Blood Cult. The Templars of Scar and Ink. This group of four men, Magic User 1, one woman, Magic User 3, are naked save for a loincloth. Their bodies are covered in tattoos and each has D3 magic runes as tattoos. A one per spell known. I may have made that up. I can't remember if I rolled for that or made it up, but this is just who they encountered. I created this cult so that when they encountered them... Now, I made this ahead of time. I have one cult on, on, on hold, you know, because you don't want to be making that up necessarily on the fly, but... That's if they encounter a cult. It's not that common, but it can happen. Okay, so past the cults, we have specials, hermit, nomads, trading post, abandoned fortress, military outpost, or a witch. These are going to be special. We're going to deal with them if they come up. Simple as that, right? Now, here's table two. These, this is my pilgrim table. This, I, I can't remember. I, I got this idea from a blog somewhere, and I cannot remember where. And there's, then I just put in my own kind of variations. What you do is you roll twice on the first table and once on the second one. So you get results like knights enslaving madmen or villagers fleeing from the sick or cursed. And this kind of puts together this little scene where the party can get involved or not get involved. It could be a problem. It could be something good. It could be brigands, you know, uh, negotiating with knights. Does the party want to get involved in that? Are they wondering what's going on? Who are these brigands? Who are these knights? Whatever works in your world, right? You're going to make it work. Like I said, this keeps you on your toes. Okay, so this one here I got from the Swords and Stitchery blog. And like I said, when I put this on my uh, Patreon area, I'm going to remove this because this is not my content here. But I will put the link, which is right here. Let's open this up. And we can see that this is from their blog. It's a really fun blog. And they've got uh, some cool art there. 120 random remains of passing of mythos. Right. So basically, this is my signs of destruction. So this is like the ground is covered with the fine layer of living flake like skin and animals die when they touch the stuff. Real fun. It worked for that particular campaign. This might be too weird for yours. You can just make a list of whatever the destruction could be. It could be natural. It could be by armies, you know, figure out what's going on in the world. Then we go further down here and I've got my random monsters. Now, these monsters I got from this book here. I think you can still find this somewhere. If, if I can find it, I'll put a link to it. This is by Fantasy Gamers Compendium by Game Science. And it just, I really like their monster section because each of these monsters, like Wendigo, Tonks, Vizebor, it doesn't give you really like true full stats. It gives you like a little bit of the myth of them. So you just have a little bit of something going on. And I was running this in uh, Limitations of the Flame Princess where monsters are basically, you just, all you really need to know is their hit dice to figure out everything else. So I would just pick the hit dice based on what I thought was appropriate. So I just needed to know what the type of monster was. So this is my list. You obviously can create your own. And what I used to do, what I was doing when I was running the campaign is I would have like about six or seven extra monsters. It's listed at the bottom. 
And every time they would encounter one, I would just delete it and add one of the, the new ones, right? This way, you're keeping it fresh. Okay, this is a totally random table. Again, I got this one from a website. This is from the Welsh Piper. Open this one up. And we can see that on theirs, it's called, uh, let's see, Minor Encounters. But I thought this would be fun because it's just something extra they can run into. So camp, semi-permanent, a way station for trappers, hunters, drovers, or messengers, right? And you could make that uh, occupied or not, really. It's up to you. So I thought this was a good little resource. You can find it online. Also, this this entire section on hex-based campaigns, obviously, since we're talking hexes, is pretty decent. Uh, check that out. I haven't read it in a while, but I obviously took something from it, so I'm, I must have liked it. And I think you get the idea. What you're doing here is creating, you're going off this base system, right? The base system or the procedure for the hex crawl is pretty simple. Move, are you lost? Is there an encounter? Use up uh, supply. But you can flesh that out and make it so much more interesting and work for your world by creating your own kind of random lists here. Like I said, one tip that I definitely would give is use something, some physical, if you will, physical, it could be virtual, representation of the travel while you're doing this. And I think that really adds to a lot of things. Otherwise, what you get is, which is also fine, but what you end up getting is kind of a narrative flow where it's just this happens, this happens, this happens. And I think that it's harder for the players to kind of get into that field, this long journey, this travel. Because if we look at a lot of the fiction that inspired D&D, there is a lot of this going on, right? There's these long treks across lands and finding beautiful sights and interesting weirdness along the way. And then they fight the big bad guy at the end, right? But there's all this kind of building up to it. And sometimes we miss that when we just drop people in here, 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 and then they're finally there, right? So this can be a really fun way to play. Let me know if you guys do hex crawls. Is this something that you've done before? Do you do stuff like I do here? Do you use something physical, like I said? Do you abstract it all? Do you just do point crawls, which I've talked about before too? Do you do just narrative travel? How do you move your characters across and through your world when they're not just in the dungeon? I'd love to know. Let me know in the comments below. I'll put a link, like I said, to this document I showed you here. I'll put a link to the resources that I've used to make some of this stuff if I can find them online. I'll put a link to my Discord that you can join and kind of join the conversation over there. And also a link to my Patreon if you'd like to support the channel. You can check that out as well. I'll see you next time.